Yes, but Kira's really getting excited about having her prom online. A virtual visit for mother and daughter repeated around the country as care home doors remain locked against the outside world. The important thing is that you're safe. So. Oh yes, yes, I feel quite safe here, yes. But at what price safety? It's impossible to measure the cost of isolation from relatives, but if you want to talk about it in terms of money, there's the cost of cleaning equipment and in personal protective equipment. At the Lillian Faithful Group of Homes in Gloucestershire, they once spent 20,000 a year on gloves, masks and aprons. Now their PPE bill is 200,000. Before we could go into their Cheltenham home, we had, of course, to be tested. An undignified experience, <coughs> but it was negative. And this was the staff being trained to use these lateral flow tests, only recently approved by the regulator for use in care homes. There is some scepticism about their reliability, but the speed with which they can be used is seen as another tool to protect the residents. If you do test positive on this course for the uh, lateral flow, you must then self-isolate okay, until the results of the PCR test come through to you. It is perfectly understandable that there might be some relatives and friends out there who are wondering why we can be in here filming when they can't come and visit. But the fact is the home wanted us to show the lengths that they are going to to protect their staff and their residents from this virus that has, let's face it, ripped through many homes like this over the past year. They've only had four cases here, all discharges from hospital. But a collective shudder goes through the home when you mention last year's Cheltenham Festival. Take me back to that week in March. What were you thinking? What was I thinking? I was thinking, my goodness, all those people are going to come into our town um, from abroad, from from all over England, all over the UK. I felt they were going to bring infections with them, so I thought it was really important that we closed down, and that's what we did. You're comfortable there, you've got enough space. Now, all these months later, there is the vaccine. Today, NHS England announced that it has been offered to every eligible care home resident. And this care home group was part of the pilot for the Pfizer vaccine rollout. More than 97% of residents have received the first dose and 63% of the staff have taken up the offer. It has made a difference. It's made us realise that we have some protection. We can't take our foot off the brakes because we know that, you know, we still can catch COVID. We may just get lighter symptoms. But overall, the staff are feeling safer. The residents are, and we look forward to our, our second vaccination, which will be fantastic. What makes you feel protected? Well, I know I'm aware of the, the great care that the staff here take. And um, I don't, what makes me feel protected? And I pray, you know, but and I pray especially for the NHS. I think they need strength at this time. If we've had the first jab, OK, I know it's not 100% fully, but I've got that security and knowledge that I'm safe to a certain extent. And yeah, that we're safe. But you weren't worried about the virus before no. the vaccine, you weren't worried about being infected? No, because we've been in lock, not lock, what they call lockdown. And um, it, when, when, when the families weren't allowed in or, or anybody wasn't allowed in, it was boof, shut, straight down, done, finished, which is brilliant. The blow of lockdown perhaps softened by pre-lunch drinks in the bar donated by a local business. Am I keeping you from your sherry? No, you're not. Well, you are, but don't worry about it. <laughs> That's right, go and get your shirt. You sure? Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. But he told me he longs for a hug from his family. And the most pressing question now is how and when can care homes restart safely those longed for visits? We don't know what the answer to that is today, but I think it's perfectly right to be asking the question and we'll be pushing government and local government and, and, and others to help come up with a timetable, to come up with a kind of route map that very clearly tells people when visiting can happen again in a meaningful way, indoors, where they can be in close contact with the people that they love. Betty. Here, though, they say now is not the time to take their foot off the pedal. 
so virtual meetings for the moment. Um, it's just it's nice just yes. to see one another and have a chat. Yes. 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 And it's better I mean, than a letter. It's a huge difference. Hmm. It is. Or a phone call. It makes a huge difference just to be able to see yes. each other, doesn't it? It does. Yes, it does. It's, it's magic. Yes. Absolute magic. And if you want to hear more from Victoria about the pandemic, vaccines and deniers, then tune into a new episode of the Channel 4 News podcast, The Forecast, out today. Find it on our website or on all major podcast platforms. Well, now, Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has been under pressure to explain the slower speed of the vaccine rollout in Scotland. Although she insists plans to give the jabs to everyone over 80 by the end of this week is, quotes, ahead of schedule... Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, is in Glasgow. Alex. Yes, First Minister under pressure, and not a little miff, the pressure, because there was a sudden, quite significant fall in the number of Scots getting the vaccination on Sunday. She said she couldn't explain that, she was looking into it. Miffed on two fronts, really, one on the issue of data of the vaccine getting into Scotland, and the other of care homes. We'll come to that in a moment. On the issue of that data, she says, quite blatantly, she sees that the UK government is apparently freely giving out some of this data, leaking it, if you will, will to sympathetic elements of the English unionist press on the one hand, but telling her she can't talk about it, which means she says she can't tell the story about, about vaccinations in full in Scotland. Some positive news for the Scottish Government today, though. He's got some pictures here showing the first public mass vaccination centre, this one in Aberdeen, another one down at another exhibition centre in Edinburgh. But, of course, this will be seized on by her political opponents. They'll say, well, this has been happening in England for some time now. Why, once again, does Scotland appear and have that perception to be lagging behind? Well, at our First Minister's press conference today, I put that to her because everybody agrees, including the Scottish Government, there are discrepancies in various statistics and in the timings of things like those vaccine centres. So if she'd made mistakes, what were they? She wasn't getting into that, but she was returning to her central theme, the strategy, which she believes is right, and the Chief Medical Officer backed her up, of getting the vaccine first and foremost to the elderly um, in those care homes. That's what she said. We did at an earlier stage of the programme and, you know, people will say, oh, this is not uh, a factor now. And they're probably right. This is not a factor now. But we are motoring through these other uh, population groups right now. But at an earlier stage of the programme, we did focus with much, much more, uh, I suppose, uh, singularity of mind on older people in care homes because they are the most vulnerable. And that does take longer um, and is more resource intensive. This was the Pfizer vaccine. It has to be uh, kept at very low temperatures, as I'm sure you're all aware by now. Getting it into care homes is obviously logistically very difficult and takes a long time. The chief medical officer at that press conference underlined that again today. And pointedly, the first minister said, well, it's great that the uh, UK government can say that they've notified and offered everyone in a care home in the UK uh, a first round of vaccination. We in Scotland, she said, have actually put it in their arms in 98% of cases, well over 80% of care home staff. They are adamant that was the right strategy. And they say if you do that and you concentrate in that way on a slow, logistically difficult, medically difficult process, of course the rollout of vaccines is going to be very different. Her political opponents, of course, say that's flummery and nonsense and excuses for what they insist is a slower process than the rest of the UK. It'll roll and roll. Back to you. Alex, thanks very much. Well, if Scotland has had issues in deploying the vaccine, much of Europe continues to struggle with getting hold of supplies. On Friday, the EU took the dramatic step of threatening to trigger Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Brexit Protocol, which could have introduced checks on the Irish border to stop EU-produced vaccines coming into the UK. The bloc has since backtracked, and today Ireland's foreign minister said the move was a mistake that shouldn't have happened. Well, I'm joined now by Ireland's Minister for Europe, Thomas Byrne. Mr Byrne, total vaccinations in Ireland, according to World in Data, stand at four in 100. In the UK, it's more than 14 in 100. Do you think you've been let down by the European Commission? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I think we're, we're glad that we've entered into a joint purchasing agreement. I think every country in the world has had difficulties with, every, with various aspects of the pandemic, and Britain is no exception, Ireland's no exception. Um, we are um, inoculating uh, using every 
dose of vaccine that we have. And I think that's the important message. Clearly, we, we want more vaccine. We're expecting that supply to ramp up, particularly in quarter two. Um, but we are vaccinating in accordance with the targets that we knew in terms of supply that we knew we'd have uh, last December. Okay. Uh, and like, like Britain as well, last week we, we concluded the, the first dose in every nursing home. Right, but uh, why do you now... think Ireland and the EU, for that matter, is lagging so far behind the UK then? Well, look, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into the reasons for that. I mean, I don't think this is a race between countries. I think it's in everybody's interests uh, to get as many people vaccinated as possible, not just in our own countries, uh, but in our, our neighbourhoods and indeed in the developing world. Um, clearly, there have been different timetables in terms of authorisation. AstraZeneca only applied for authorisation uh, on the 12th of January, as I understand, in the European Union. That was given last week. They themselves then uh, announced uh, kind of out of the blue that they had supply issues, which led to the um, issue on Friday. But that was because they had supply issues, because so they had it, contracted. So is it their fault rather than the European Commission? Because the, the German newspaper Die Zeit says that this whole fiasco has been, quote, a good advert for Brexit. Do you disagree with that? I, no, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. And I don't think it has anything to do with Brexit, to be absolutely fair. Uh, Britain authorised its vaccines at a quicker pace, but using rules that any member state could do. And in fact, Hungary has gone ahead and uh, authorised Russian and Chinese vaccines. And I'm, not, I'm not proposing that we do that. Well, should you uh, have done oh, something similar, though? Well, we don't have the data. Well, I think as a small country, I think the uh, idea of the European Commission buying on behalf of all of the member states suits us, uh, that we don't have to start jockeying for position with larger countries. We're part of a bigger purchasing arrangement. Right. Uh, and certainly the rates of vaccination in Ireland compare very favourably within the European Union. OK, what so but you make the point is, well, that it's not a race between countries, that, you know, no one's protected until everybody's protected. So would you like the UK to send Ireland any surplus jabs in time then? Well, I understand that there's no offer for surplus jabs at the moment when there is a shortage of supply. So uh, I think we will all actually have surplus jabs. The European, in, in, when you come into quarter two and particularly quarter three, uh, the European Union has bought, just like Britain, has ordered many more times vaccines uh, than we have people in the European Union. Well, would you like some from the UK now? I know that's not specifically on offer, but what would you but say it, to Minister? Sorry, it's, it's, a, it's a hypothetical question. It is not an offer. Uh, we wish Britain well. Uh, we, we want to get as many vaccines into our citizens' arms as possible, and we're using all of the supply that we get. And that supply is going to increase uh, in the next while. Right. Yes, it would be great to be a bit quicker about it. Absolutely. I, I don't deny that at all. Um, but we, we expect that we will be fully on track and moving into the uh, under 70s once you get into quarter two. Yeah. But like Britain, we've just completed care homes as well. I mean, Britain has only passed that milestone now, and that's that's a big achievement. Okay. And it's very hard to do with COVID, but we've done that too. How shocked were you when you learnt on Friday, well, the Taoiseach learnt that the European Commission planned to invoke Article 60, 16, overriding part of the Brexit agreement? How shocked were you when you heard about that? <laughs> we were very surprised, to say the least. Um, and I think that's why the Taoiseach... Uh, at, uh, as soon as it became apparent that this was proposed by the European Commission, was straight on to the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. And I think over the course of various conversations uh, throughout Friday evening, I think the Commission uh, reversed course on that. They, it was a mistake, it was a bad mistake, uh, but to be fair to them, they recognised that, and before everybody went to bed on Friday, it was changed. Uh, but there are serious lessons to be learned, there's no doubt about it. You cannot just take unilateral action with regard to Northern Ireland, no matter who you are, because it always provokes an opposite reaction, and that's destabilising uh, to Northern Ireland. So we've been consistent about this, whether it was actions by, by Britain and the Internal Market Bill or indeed actions uh, by the European Union uh, in relation to the protocol. Uh, we think it shouldn't have happened, and clearly that was agreed. And I think what, what has happened now is that uh, they, they, that's been acknowledged. Um, clearly lessons will have to be learned. The Commission is going to have to have newer procedures in to make sure that if any aspect of the protocol is going to be impact, impacted by any actions that they take, uh, that they need to uh, go through the, the, the processes that are there, first of all, among the member states, particularly ourselves, but also with Britain too, right. uh, to make sure that we work on track, because peace in Northern Ireland and maintaining uh, a no hard border approach requires uh, really strong interaction uh, right. between Britain and Ireland and between Britain and the European Union as well. Okay. Thomas Byrne, thanks very much for